Morning, morning. Here's what I love. I actually really enjoy that we are um, greeting and we're catching up on each other's lives. And so it's always fun for me to think, I'm going to have to settle them down. Uh, but it, that is great. It is great to be here. Um, we're happy to have you with us this morning, whether you've been here since this building opened, um, or you are here for the first time, we are here to gather to celebrate what God has done and is doing. So today we worship. And we welcome those of you who are joining our second service that will appear later online. We're grateful to have you with us uh, via the electronic way. Uh, we're happy to have you join in as we worship the Lord. Now I am, I just mentioned, you guys have, are pretty good at the greetings, but I want to take just a couple of minutes, and by a couple, I mean a couple, uh, if you would just join me as we greet maybe a couple people you haven't already said hi to this morning, and then we'll get going. Ready? Go. A couple minutes. That's it. All right. Oh. Okay, I want to, yes, they make. We're ready. I can tell by the buzz. Yeah, this was going to be a tough one. Ooh, can you imagine if I whistled in this thing? Ooh. Well, we are grateful to be here with one another uh, to worship the Lord. I get to start with something fun and something we get to do uh, when somebody who's been part of the church has acknowledged, hey, I really dig the DNA of the Church of the Nazarene, and I want to officially be a member. Now, that plays out in different ways. Some people uh, can go online. They can look through all of our membership videos and info. Uh, they can fill out the forms and decide, yeah, I, I want to be an official member. Uh, they can be born into the church and think they're official members and then later find out, oh wait, there's a process on the official part. Uh, they can transfer membership if they are already part of a, a Nazarene church and they've moved. We've had that a couple times recently. But this one this morning is one who has just, just been here. Maybe not all of his life, but he's just been here. 
And so here's what we need to know about membership is our church is open and we are welcoming all those who want to join in for worship. Uh, and then there's other levels of responsibility and, and benefits of becoming a member. And so we have uh, one who has said, man, I did the Phineas F. Brzee Award. I'm serving in the church and I'm not a member. How do I officially do that? So Mikey and I have met and chatted. Uh, Michael Shearer, will you come up, please? Yeah. You're gonna sign up here. You're, you're up. Go this way. <laughs> Mikey said, if I just stay down off the platform, then we're closer to the same height, which is true. So I need platform shoes, an actual platform, and he still probably beat me, yes. So Michael has been part of our church since he was a wee little tad and is actually known for being the one as he was growing up through the children's program and the youth program would be the one quickest to say, I'll read scripture. Uh, Mikey had to move across town and was in Tempe for a year and a half, almost two years, something like that. Yeah, while well, he's getting his feet uh, into ASU. And then his work pulled him back here yeah, which means uh, he is going to be with us on a permit basis, and, and again, we've got him on the drums. Now, Mikey, you already know the doctrine, our articles of faith, and you, you are in line with, hey, I love the DNA of the church, correct? Yep. And you are willing to continue to use your gifts and your talents to benefit the church as a whole. Nice. All right, now church. Uh, Mikey's been with us for a long time, but we will also come alongside him as he continues to disciple, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, Mikey, here's the deal. Official Church of the Nazarene member. Congratulations. Yeah. All right. I feel bad when, uh, when I brought Tor Pastor Tori on in a transfer, I didn't have the membership. So like a week later, I said, here, this is for you. It makes it official. <laughs> uh, that's it, really. The, it's just the paper. That's all Mikey wanted, just the paper. <laughs> Actually, benefit is um, we already had Mikey, and he was considered a member. Uh, but now it's official, and we're, we're grateful to have him and have him serve with us. I do have one other announcement, and then I'm going to turn it over to Bob. So technically, this is a pre-announcement. Uh, but in our staff, we like to just kind of celebrate birthdays and special things. So um, there's an anniversary. Annette and Danny Hovis, will you just stand? They have their anniversary tomorrow. <laughs> Happy anniversary. Rory. <laughs> I won't make you come all the way to the front, but Rory, you're a fast runner. Can you get him? Yeah. All right. Now, guess what time it is? Uh, did I steal your thunder? It's Bob time. Whoa, that's not. Woo. Okay, wait. Okay, that's better. Um, hey, it, you're right. It's time for announcements. Um, here's the thing. I'm gonna. Um, I, I'm gonna ask you to just strap in and hang on for a minute because there's so much going on this week i have to go really fast and i'm good at talking fast just in case like i i, I could auction i i don't know um in the next six days five announcements in six days about stuff going on at our church and you've heard me say this before that jazzes me because that's a group of people who's awake and alive and participating and active and so i'm excited i'm always excited um, this week, uh, tomorrow, Chapel Bells. So we start off with Monday, Chapel Bells. Ladies, 11 o'clock here at the church, good stuff. Also on Monday, Young Adult Bible Study. So we got two things in one day, bonus material. Um, Tuesday, church board meeting. I said it before, if you know who you are, now you know when it is. Wednesday, Wednesday is full of activities. Um, Wednesday morning, senior adult. Wednesday evening, something for everyone. Children's, teens, women, men, find a category, put yourself in it, there's something for you. Uh, Thursday, crafting bee. I love crafting bee. I love the idea of crafting bee anyway. I haven't been to crafting bee. Don't guilt me, I'm sorry. I can be excited about something and not participate in it, that's okay. 
But crafting bee on Thursday, either bring your own craft or a craft will be provided for you. Um, Friday, I, I don't know, day of rest. Take a day on Friday. I didn't have an announcement for Friday. That's just the way things go. Take a day. Saturday, youth event uh, at Haven Church. We talked about it last week. It's Kajabi. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. It seems kind of weird to me. But it's young people, so that's to be expected. Six days, five announcements. That's a whole lot going on. Now, in terms of kind of looking longer term, there's more stuff coming up. Um, next week we start, next Sunday we start with uh, ch church elections. So make sure you participate, make your voice heard. That's an important thing. Looking down the line a little bit, um, a new item in the announcements, and that's April 28th, Caravan Camp Inn. Can you say date night? Okay, you know, how, you know how when you're in school and your grades are not going so good, so you go to the teacher and you ask for extra credit? Dads, if you're not doing so good on your grades in the husband department, <laughs> extra credit, plan something. Plan, I don't care if it's Netflix and chill. <laughs> Didn't think I knew that phrase, did you? I, I don't care what it is. It doesn't take that much to make a reservation. It, it, Netflix and chill is practically free. You could even dazzle your spouse with your culinary skills. Um, do something. Take this opportunity. Take the opportunity to get the kids out of the house and have a date night, and you will score major husband points. Maybe even enough to pull you up a letter grade, okay? Um, and then there's more stuff coming up in the month in, in, in May, Spring Ladies Luncheon and Elevate and Youth Camp and Kids Camp, and it just goes on and on. And we'll get to those eventually. We'll get to all those announcements and more. There's no, there's no excuse to just sit here in the chairs on Sunday morning and then repeat that every seven days. There's something for everyone always going on, lots of activities. Get engaged with us. Thank you, that's all. Go right ahead. <laughs> Would you stand with us, please? I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah.
righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. and lead us in the reading of the word. And Mikey, will you read us, lead us in the Please join me in reading. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Let us pray. Father, thank you for you this beautiful day. Thank you for your blessing. We are here to listen uh, your word, O oh God. We ask you that you speak to us and help us to listen and practice your word, O oh Lord. In your name, Jesus Christ, we pray and believe. Amen. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, again, welcome. Thank you, Makisa, for praying. And we do meet and we gather and we sing praises. Oh, sorry, Dennis, I might be a little hot on that mic. Uh, we sing praises. We also gather around the word because like, oh, yeah, children, you're dismissed. Man, I'm really glad. I am so thankful for that slide. Yeah. Uh, we also gather around the word, which is what the kids will be doing next door as well. 
and we want the word to change us. So some of us, we've been gathering around the word because uh, we were born, maybe not at the church, but pretty much into the church. Uh, and we've just been following Christ that long, and we can still engage the word, and it has these, these layers and this depth that is inexhaustible. And then some of us come, and, and we're kind of new to it, and we might not quite get all of it, but we're trying to, to grab a hold of what Jesus is doing in his word. Uh, and so we do that together, and today we are going to be in Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to talk a little bit about peace. As you head to Philippians, I'm actually going to give a little bit more of what we talked about last week, so just hold tight in the book of Philippians chapter 4. Uh, because we got some, some great instruction from Jesus after his resurrection. So last week we had a wonderful celebration, and we looked at how Christ not only sacrificed for us, but returned and then gave instruction on how we're to live life and live it to the full. How we can celebrate the victory he had over death and have that be incorporated into our lives. And so as you know, we, we only have so much time each Sunday, and, and we can plod through quite a bit. But last week, we didn't get through all of that storyline. So I just want to read to you out of John's Gospel uh, some of how that played out once Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, it says in chapter 20 of John, On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leadership, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And then it goes on. Now, Thomas also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came that day. So the other disciples told him, Hey, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. The, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. And he said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus told them, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. One of the first things Jesus does as he returns is he gives this greeting to them, and he says it more than once, and he says, peace be with you. There's a ton that could have been spoken in that moment, but as he returned and as he encountered the disciples who were faithfully by his side, um, who had now, you see, locked themselves up in a room for fear of the religious leaders, Jesus just appears to them in that room, and he starts out with, peace be with you. <sighs> There's a lot in, in just those three words, peace be with four. I knew it. I messed that up. In those four words, now you'll never forget it. Four words, peace be with you. Uh, there's something significant with he started there. Now, uh, I would imagine if we could look at scripture, we get an idea of their state of mind, just their presence, right? Uh, Jesus had died. Uh, the, the religious leaders were, you know, celebrating the W. Rome had taken care of anything that might stir up trouble. And now the disciples have hidden themselves and they've locked themselves in rooms because they're not sure what is going to happen. And then Jesus appears to them and says, peace be with you. And then in fact, he says it twice. 
that first go round. And then Thomas wasn't there. So as Thomas is in the room, he appears again and he says the same thing to Thomas. My peace be with you. Now, if we give a little bit of credit to the disciples, they had seen tremendous things. They had walked with Jesus. Their, their lives had been changed. But this is a season of their life where things are just in upheaval. All that their teacher had said and done was significant, life-changing, but now their teacher was gone. Rome and the religious leaders had killed him. And so they're trying to sort out what their next steps are. And the resurrected one comes in and says, peace be with you. I don't know how each of, I, I love we've been talking about the show, The Chosen, and how it kind of brings to life some of the personalities, some of the, the real life stuff that goes on with us as disciples. Uh, if I was in that room, it is very possible I would have heard the peace be with you and still been all wound up. That's one of my character traits. I get all wound up. How can I have peace? Uh, we, you're dead. Uh, everybody's celebrating the win, and I don't know what to do. And in the midst of it, I would have been actually standing right next to the resurrected Jesus and still been all wound up. But this doesn't make sense. Uh, a ton of questions before I realized, wait, you're actually here. Wait a minute. Have you ever done that? In life, you just go... Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do that a lot. I say that phrase, wait a minute, when something clicks, I feel like I'm about five minutes behind, or more. That they're standing with Jesus, and Jesus says, peace be with you. Uh, now, has any of their circumstances in that point changed? No. Uh, does it bring an immediacy of joy? Scripture tells us, oh, then they started to celebrate. And probably not because they could have seen what was about to happen in the next 10 years, 100 years, 2,000 years. That they would have been rejoicing because their friend is back. And Jesus actually starts with peace be with you. And what we see is the circumstances don't necessarily get easy for the disciples. But the disciples will have something within their core that holds them steady through the rest of their lives. Uh, it's intriguing to, to watch some of what we know about the disciples and where they end up, but Jesus says this, this phrase, peace be with you, and it is something that we know and we read in Scripture. Paul is going to mention it here again, and he has come on a little bit later. Uh, he has become a believer and a follower of the way, but... Uh, a significant portion after the disciples. And so he, is, he has himself been discipled, and then he becomes what we call just the pastor of pastors. And he just begins to go and preach the word. Jesus changes his life that much. Um, and what we know about Paul is his circumstances were not always wonderful, but Paul is going to write to the church in Philippi, uh, Paul has a, a deep connection with this church. Uh, might be his favorite child, I don't know. One day I'm going to ask him. Uh, but it does feel like there is that connectivity with this congregation. And so he writes to them, and here's what we see in the letter uh, that Paul writes. There are themes that, to me, are quite interesting. Themes of uncertainty with joy. That's a juxtaposition that seems hard to understand. I, I mean, I love it when I'm uncertain of things. It's my favorite. No, it's not. I, I, there's no joy. When I'm uncertain of something, I don't think that's where I'll find my most joy. I want to know how things are going to play out, what the purpose is. This is I, I don't enjoy being uncertain. Sometimes it's for our betterment, right? Maybe we don't know all of the steps, and that might be good. I uh, managed to have an incident with a very sharp quilting tool. 
you're laughing like you already know. What's funny is if my family's watching, they're going to be, yeah, the incident that you caused. Uh, tell you that story another time. It resulted in uh, me not letting go of my finger for 15 minutes, riding in a car like this, and heading to the ER. I'll tell you that much. And um, I didn't, like, your pinky's small. How can it bleed that much? I don't know. But at one point, I'm realizing this is going to require stitches. I had never had stitches before. They, um, maybe because they knew how it happened, they didn't show a lot of grace or patience. And so they just kind of came in. They put this cart there. There's instruments, very large needle, and stuff. And I'm, you know, I'm still hoping out. Maybe they'll just butterfly bandage it or something. I know the nurse is in here laughing at me, and I'm thinking, it's, you know, it's just the pinky. There's not a lot there. And then I'm realizing the doctor comes in, and he said, it's going to take a couple stitches, and he gets to work. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And he grabs my arm, and he just holds it there. And I'm like, oh, I am uncertain of what's about to happen, and I don't like this. So I paused him. I need to ask questions. How do you do this? And again, with great tolerance, uh, I got a very short answer. <laughs> uh, and I said, okay. And he said, we're going to put in the local anesthesia, and then I'm going to sew it up. I think that was the best explanation he could have given me at the time. And I was like, okay, that's great. That's a big needle. That's a very small part of my body here. <laughs> and it is cut open, and that just sounds very unpleasant. And I was like, where exactly does that go? Please tell me somewhere up here, and it'll just shoot the whole arm numb. Somewhere there's a lot of tissue, and he's not amused. And he looked at me, and he goes, where do you want it numb? I was like, right now, everywhere. <laughs> I'm terrified. I know it's not going to take much, but I don't like not knowing. I've never been through this process, and now I'm going to have to go through this process, and I'm getting thrown into it. I feel like the disciples had to have had those moments of, we do not know what this process looks like, and they're getting thrown right into it. Uh, but they have this encounter with Jesus, and Jesus says, peace be with you, and then he sends them out. Uh, and then their whole world looks different. Our world looks different because of that message. But they didn't have all the answers. Uh, they, there was uncertainty at every step um, that some of them might have felt they were taking. But what they were certain of was Christ. So now we, we fast forward a little bit and we see Paul uh, has been discipled and is is now leading churches, and then he writes to one of the churches, and, and he says, you know, there's this uncertainty in, in, our, in our context, and I understand that, um, but there is great joy that we have because we're connected to Jesus. Uh, there's themes of, of peace, there's themes of self-sacrifice that he and the church just seem to understand that seem to be kind of central and core to who they are as a, a people and who they are together. And they, their confidence does not come from their own flesh. Their confidence comes in Christ. And so in Philippians 4, 7, Paul's going to hit on this idea of peace. And this idea of peace sounds awesome. I often hear it pulled from Scripture. Um, I have seen it tattooed. I, it's, a, it's a hope and a promise that is great. And it's even better when we understand the bigger picture of what is being said. So in, in Philippians chapter 4, we're going to start reading in verse 7. It's a small portion, but it's got a lot of stuff within it. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. <sighs> all right, we're going to stick just with that last line for right now. And it says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I want to kind of break down just the sentence. There's a peace of God that transcends. That's a big word. It is something that is above and beyond. If we were to look in the dictionary, it'll say excellent or superior. Those are things we like to hear. 
Uh, we want the things that are excellent and superior, and it's great if they come at no cost to us. Uh, but very rarely does that happen. Uh, but we like uh, the idea of getting something that maybe is above and beyond what could be, and it, it just makes it better. When, when I started my journey with automobiles, I had um, this lovely little Peugeot. I couldn't spell it, but I had a key to it, and it was functional and a blessing until it wasn't. Uh, I had the radiator blow up in my face, thank you, Lord, that that didn't go worse than what it was. Uh, I had some difficulty with it, and so I ended up getting a different car. And that car kind of leveled up. Uh, I make a joke, I, I believe Peugeots make bicycles as well as automobiles, and I figured out why. <laughs> It's a secondary form of transportation when the vehicle doesn't work. <laughs> so, uh, granted, I, I, it, you know, I was learning how to take care of cars and how to do things, but then I ended up with a Corsica, a beautiful little car, ran a lot of miles and kept me going. Um, I didn't have to keep checking if the radiator had fluid in it or not. It wouldn't overheat. It felt like, oh, this is superior to the last one. And then I ran that one, I held onto it as long as I could. And then I realized, whew, I might need to get something. And I, I feel like it was an upgrade to a Corsica. It felt like bigger, more luxurious. I say luxurious, because I was in my 20s, maybe 30, 20s, 30s. And uh, the teens I worked with called it uh, a mature person's car. Uh, <laughs> So again, you know, I had issues, but it was a blessing. I, I think I had that 10 years. I, at one point, um, one of the teens, I think, tried to Dukes of Hazard it through the window and just kind of took the whole inside of the door off with his bum as he came in through the window, but it still worked. It was functional. I got a good 10 years out of it. And then I got my Camry. Oh, I was in my 30s at that point going, this feels like the grown-up car. I have my first real grown-up car is what I felt like. And I still have that thing. 11 years later, in fact, I just pulled in at home this weekend and saw 222,222 miles, right? It's a fun number. But also, those of you that drive in own cars, oh, yeah. And then people tell me, it's just getting started. And I'm thinking, well, I hope so. Well, I hope so. But every time we, we understand this idea of well, maybe just a little bit better. Paul is actually giving something that is, is important to the core of the church, which is the peace of God will transcend, will be above and beyond, will excel, will be better than anything that could be given here on this earth that is not of God. That it is the better route and we love that stuff. So he's saying, the peace of God, it's just better. Now, does it actually make our situation better, or does it just make us better? Sometimes both. But what is consistent is it will change the core of who we are. It will protect us as this broken world kind of runs us through these ringers. So he's going to uh, carry on. He says, the peace of God which transcends all understanding. I want to stop at the understanding part. Uh, I'm doing some readings that are eye-opening and just a good reminder. I am pretty limited on my understanding. Uh, you know, at 19, I knew far more than my parents. Uh, <laughs> I know, it's funny, but we all were 19, let's just face it. Uh, I felt like, you know, I, I could do this, I got this. And then I started walking through this world, and the more I learned, the more I realized there was to learn. Uh, the more I learned, the more obvious it became to me that I did not know everything. In fact, I, I'm pretty capable of knowing a small amount. 
And so Paul is saying, guess what? Our understanding is going to be limited. I'm thinking of heading to Six Flags years ago. They opened a new ride, and there was a group of us that went. Uh, I like roller coasters. I watch all the little things about roller coasters. I am not an engineer. Again, clear to say that. Uh, it fascinates me. I really hope they picked the smart ones to build this one. I get on this ride, and I'm busy being social, and I'm chatting with the people I'm riding the rides with, and I get in, locked in, next to a friend, and I think I'm probably still chatting, and then it just goes. And I don't know what happened. Um, I just remember thinking, whoa, and then it was gone. And I'm, I feel like we were backwards, and I wasn't expecting the uh, laying upside down part. And all this stuff that I was trying to like, oh, I, I, I got off of the roller coaster. And some of my friends are like, whoa, and they're pretty jazzed on adrenaline. And the one looks at me and says, what'd you think? And this was how I responded. True to every word. I don't know what just happened. <laughs> but I liked it. <laughs> I don't understand the mechanics of it, how fast it was going, how it was put together. I didn't understand when or where it was going to end. I don't even think I was directionally forward. I don't know what happened because uh, my understanding is limited, but I liked it. Paul is reminding us there is a peace that is above and beyond the situational things. It's better than anything all things put together is the peace that God can give, and it will go beyond our understanding. And that frustrates me. I could get off that ride and go, let's do it again. I don't care. I don't need to know the schematics. I'm just going to focus this time, and maybe I can take it in. I don't need to know all that. But there are times and things in my life's life when it gets hard, I want to know how this is going to work out. Jesus, where are you in the midst of this? Why is this going on? And, and inside of me becomes uh, this struggle. Inside of me becomes this tension and this, this difficulty. And Paul is saying, there's a peace that is above what you're going to go through, and it is bigger than your own understanding. Oh, that really resonates with me. There's a lot I don't understand. I am trying to do my best, but there's still more that I won't be able to put together. And so I want to rest in Jesus. We sang it this morning in the midst of the storm. I'll sing in the midst of the storm. Why? Well, we could sing to have it stop, but we could also just sing to the God who is present, whether the storm is or is not. Uh, we can raise a hallelujah in the midst of what the enemy is throwing at us because we know he's already been the victor, and he came back saying, peace, I give you. Oh, even better, we need does this in the, with the disciples. He says, peace be with you. And then he has to repeat it. Um, then he breathes on them the Holy Spirit. The same spirit that is living and active and working today. That is our presence and our sense of peace. We know about peace, and I really love this idea of this transcendent peace. But I also am aware I can get pretty wrapped up in my own stuff. And I can focus on such a small area when God has such a big picture of Chrissy, I'm with you. I'm here. The disciples did not have an idea of what was going to go on from the resurrection forward, but they knew their friend was alive again. And then he gave them the instructions to live in peace. Peace be with you. I am here. He told Thomas, I am here. I am physically here. I have overcome death. Come see. Now peace be with you. As you move forward, and whew, they had, talk about roller coasters. They were all over doing what God asked them to do. Well, 
<laughs> our understanding can be limited, but there are some things we do grasp, some things we can kind of hold on to. Uh, let's play a little game. I'm going to give you part of a phrase, and let's see if you can remember and predict what I will uh, say is the blank. You guys fill in the blank. So I'll say something, I'll stop, and then collectively we'll see how much we know and understand. Uh, if I were to say something about breakfast this morning, uh, if, if I had my rathers and could just make breakfast every Sunday, I would probably choose something along the lines of bacon and... Oh, somebody, you're wrong, but I like, you, I like those. Those are good too. Bacon and eggs, all right. Uh, as a kid, sandwiches, I ate PB and jelly. jelly. Jam? Did somebody say? Uh, PB and J. PB and J. Yes, sorry, yes. Peanut butter and jelly. Well, uh, here's something else I know that there are times in my life where I just need some peace and. Oh, you all got it on that one. Yeah, you're with me. You're with me. Peace and quiet. All right, I experienced this recently, and I just wanted to go home, and I wanted it to be quiet. I live alone. <laughs> and I, I was yearning for quiet. It's reasonably quiet in my place. But the quiet I was looking for was not about an external noise level. The quiet I was looking for was internal, because my mind was racing. Uh, my heart was busy, churning on things it shouldn't churn on. And I just needed to be quiet. There is an understanding of God's peace that comes when we quiet ourselves before him. That it's his peace that he freely gives but what we do know is we can put ourselves in spaces. It may be a house. House may not be quiet for you. It may be just one of the rooms. It may be in a drive. It may be as you steady yourself with music and you let that minister to you. But as we quiet ourselves before God, he has space to settle our unsettledness. Uh, he has space to then speak peace into our core. We know about peace, um, and, and here's what I love. If we read it again, it says in uh, verse 7, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, which is excellent, superior, way better than anything else, that we could imagine, think through, it will guard your hearts, and your mind in Christ Jesus. Paul knows a little bit about guarding. When he writes this, and he speaks, peace be with you, and he talks about how uh, there's trial and tribulation, and in that we have joy, he's writing from prison. And he is encouraging not just the church at Philippi, but us, to be still and receive the peace of God. That there is something that comes when we add that of God that steadies us. And then he says this, it's going to guard your heart and your mind. Guards, right, they're to either keep something in or keep things out. They're put to maintain an order, to protect uh, keep Paul in for this one. Uh, keep rescuers out. I believe if we look through this, there are things that we should be storing up in our hearts that should be kept in and guarded. I think there's also things we need to release and let out of our heart. And so Paul is saying, you know what? The peace of God will actually protect your heart and your mind. When we settle in, not to the circumstance, but to the one above who has been victorious over death, 
who actually gives a peace that is better than anything, all things that we could gather together here in this earth, that that will protect our heart and our mind. That Paul had got to the point where he says, I've learned to be content, whether I have a little or a lot, I've got Jesus. And the inner, you just hear the inner core of who he is, is stabilized by the peace of God, regardless of the situation. And that's not to say that the situations were uh, easy for Paul. We see over and over, uh, I mean, more sermons could be done on how he was shipwrecked, imprisoned, imprisoned again, imprisoned again, I think. How uh, he just didn't have maybe the easiest road, and yet the one thing that mattered is that he was going to live for Christ, and that, that steadied the core of who he was in the midst of things not going exactly maybe as they had, he had expected or his understanding would take him to. Now, I would love to say there's this magic formula, and now that I'm lead pastor, I have it, and I'm going to give it to you, and here's how you receive the peace of God. Except it's not mine to give, but what I understand is God gives it freely. And I think there is a little bit of a key here. We can know some things. Our understanding is going to be very limited compared to what God can do and what he knows. And, and maybe it's a good thing if I don't know all the steps right now. Maybe I just need to trust that he knows what he's doing. I had to trust that that doctor knew what he was doing. I got the stitches, they came out, everything's fixed. I probably shouldn't have asked him all the questions I did and just let it happen. Uh, God actually has a plan for us, for each one of us, for us as a church. And he sees a bigger picture. We may not fully understand it, but he's called us into his discipleship and then he's actually giving us his peace. Here's, how, here's the key. Here's what we do know is the beginning part that Paul gives. It says this in verse 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Anybody else now singing it? No? Yeah, all right, there it is. Yeah, if you don't know the song, you're fine. Okay, uh, you can still rejoice. One, one of you knew the song, that's it? Okay, actually, I think there's more than one song. But Then it says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Rejoice in the Lord always. I don't, I don't want to rejoice when it's tough, when I'm confused, when I'm frustrated. And yet Paul says, here's where God's peace lies. You just keep rejoicing in him. He doesn't say, just be glad, be happy. It's okay, these trials will, you know, they're for your betterment. Those aren't the words he gives in this moment. He just says, rejoice in the Lord. Not the circumstance, rejoice in the Lord. Because we serve a God who's victorious. And then some phrase it, let your moderation be made known. Live in contentment of life, knowing God is with you. And then it goes on about our prayer world, how we just sit and we take time to align ourselves, to, to bring the troubles and the, the stuff that is stirring inside of us before God. And it says, don't be anxious about anything. Now, anxious is, is an emotion. It can happen without us intentionally saying, I would like to be anxious today and step into that door. There are things that we have emotional response. Paul's not negating that. Uh, what Paul is saying is don't let your anxieties carry you away. Um, that, it's a real thing. When I say I get all wound up, um, uh, it's because I'm being anxious about 10 steps down the road I need to be or something, and I, I recognize that. And he says, just don't be anxious. Go to God first. Um, I seem to think that I can fix it if I just now work harder, faster, I can get to that 10th step, and usually I end up failing. And even when I do, you know what happens? I'm thinking about the next 10. That in my own self, my own understanding, I can't even get through the day without getting all wound up on all the things that should be done, I'm required to, or responsible for, or, and Paul's saying, it's almost as if he's saying, easy there, Chrissy. Settle down, settle, stop, 
and bring this before the Lord. Because he carries on. He says, don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, wait, I don't like all this stuff. I don't want it. I'm not a thankful heart. I'm an anxious heart. I just stepped through that door. And Paul's trying to grab me by the shirt collar, pull me out, and then remind me that I serve a God who is, is generous with this peace and who has a plan for my life, and I don't have to have it all figured out. But I need to come before him. And then it's amazing what thanksgiving does, what praise does. The Lord inhabits the praise of his people. That somehow in that space, when I shift and I decide to go through the other door, and stuff can still be going on, it may not all be fixed, but Lord, I'm grateful that you are with me. And now, Lord, here's where my heart is, is in need. Here's where I think it, this is just not right. Here's where I'm brokenhearted. And then we present it to God. God will take it, but God desires to give us his peace. And I think de Jesus demonstrated that with the first phrases he gave his disciples. Later he says, in this world you love trouble, but fear not, for I've overcome this world. Okay, out of anxiety into this door. Jesus, but you've overcome this world. So I'm going to keep walking. You're with me. Just guide me. Coming out of, of, of this, this feeling of stress. Okay, Lord, you've overcome this world, and you are guiding me. Maybe there's some brokenness, and that door slammed on the other side of us, and we can't find our way out. Lord, you've overcome this world. You are with me. Will you fix this broken heart of mine? Paul gives direction to a group of people that he cared very much about. Um, and that direction was, I have something I want to share, and I want you to live in the peace of God. Because the rest of this world is unpredictable. We can't understand all of what's going on. But our peace will come through Christ. And it is something that is beyond us, but he freely gives it. I'm going to have the worship team come forward, and as we sing through our, our closing song, uh, I, I will open up altars like we'll do every week, um, because this space is a space where we can maybe pause, settle our hearts, and come before God. And you can do that in your seats, you can do that at home, online. Uh, but this is a time that we'll open up for there's just things maybe we need to bring before God. Uh, maybe some of us just really need, Lord, will you let that peace guard my heart and my mind because I'm struggling, I'm hurting. Uh, maybe there's things that, of healing, um, things in, in the family, things that you just want to, you don't know what to do. It's beyond your grasp. It's beyond your understanding and beyond your ability to fix. And so, Lord, will you just draw near to me. Will you fill me um, as I have to move forward in this brokenness? Will you, will you heal this? Will you heal them? Jesus, where are you in this? Just show me where you are and bring me your peace. Will you stand with us as we sing? The altars are open if you want to pray here. My 
not just the victory of him overcoming death but the fact that he left us the holy spirit the fact that he is still at work today and then the glorious thought that he will return and bring us to glory that this broken world is temporary and that god is moving in it to reconcile all people to himself and so as we head out this week that's the peace and the hope that we hold on to. That's the peace that we need to take time to quiet ourselves before and let it guard our hearts and our minds. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we are so grateful uh, for your peace. Uh, Lord, our strength comes not from within our own selves that can only go so far, uh, but our strength comes from you. And so Jesus says you have... Um, have reached into this broken world, have walked our, our trod, and, and Jesus said, as you have taken our sins upon you, Lord, you in your gloriousness, in your graciousness, have actually overcome that death and then came to breathe life and your spirit into us. And so as we head out this week, uh, Lord, may you steady our hearts and our minds. May the peace that comes from you that is above, that is excellent, and that is better than, uh, Lord, may it reach beyond our own understanding. Uh, and Lord, may we sit within the peace of who you are, uh, within the peace of knowing you are the creator, we are the created, and you love us dearly. And then Jesus says, we do have things we want to bring before you. Uh, Lord, will you quiet our anxious heart? Will, may we remember to give you thanks for being a God who is generous, who loves, uh, who disciplines and steers us in right directions. And then Jesus, will you hear your people's cry? Uh, Lord, for those of us who, who might face a difficult week, for those of us who are going to face heartbreaking weeks, Will you be the peace that protects our heart? We piece us back together when the world tries to break us apart. Uh, Jesus, for those of us who just are going to come alongside people who are struggling, uh, who are, are unsure, who are anxious, may we be your peace. Uh, may we breathe onto them a sense of your love. And then, Jesus, will you just continue to guide us as we take steps this this. Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, as we don't always know uh, the full plan that you have, will you strengthen us and help us keep walking toward you on a daily basis, and we'll continue to give you the praise. 
We love you. Amen. God is good? All the time. All the time? God is good. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you guys. Worry.